Good afternoon. My name is Bill Sweeney. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of IFAS, and we are delighted to be here to host this panel discussion on the Arab Spring as part of Transatlantic Week. IFAS has been involved in the promotion of democracy for the last 23 years. This NGO has been involved in 133 elections around the world, and we currently have 27 missions that are active in the promotion of democracy and, and enhancing the capacity of election management bodies as we speak. Today's panel is going to focus on the Arab Spring and what the Arab Spring means in terms of the promotion of democracy and the steps ahead. We are honored to have three panelists with us. The first to my left is Ambar Zabari, who is the Deputy Director for the Middle East Programs here at IFAS. To her left is Elmer Brock, member of the European Parliament since 1980, one of the leaders of the promotion of election observation and the engagement of the European Parliament and the European community in the democracy building process around the world. And finally, third is my colleague Michelle Dunn, who is with the Atlantic Council, starting the brand new Harari Center as part of their activities, which will be a very, very exciting a development for the Atlantic Council. Michelle, as you all know, is one of the leading experts on the Middle East, having been a diplomat in a number of countries, as well as one of the great contributors to the thought process around the world. To set the stage today on the situation in the Middle East from the perspective of democracy enhancement and democracy promotion, our first speaker will be Amber. Amber? Okay, just checking to make sure everybody can hear me on this. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Bill um, for the introductions, uh, also our communications team and the Transatlantic uh, Policy Network who helped to put together today's event. Um, and finally, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be on a panel with two such distinguished panelists, um, both of whose bios I've looked at and felt very nervous about serving on the panel with as a, as a result. Uh, I was told that I have approximately 10 minutes to set mm -hmm. the stage, and to talk about the Arab Spring in 10 minutes is extremely difficult because it's been so diverse and um, across so many different countries that it's hard to focus on generalities. Unfortunately, given only 10 minutes, that's what I'm going to have to do. And so as, as everybody knows, the signs, of, if you look back in retrospect, were always there. Something was going to happen in the region. But nobody could have predicted exactly how the Arab Spring was going to um, play out, nor how widespread it was. In fact, I remember when I was watching um, the, the proceedings on TV when Mubarak gave his speeches um, and when the protests were happening in Tahrir Tar Tar Square, um, we, were, we would sit around and joke about whether this could possibly happen in, in Libya and Syria. And of course, we dismissed it at that point, um, not knowing that very soon after there would actually be movement in Syria and Libya as well. It's interesting to note that the primary narratives that the West has focused on in the last couple of decades, um, those of 9-11, for example, um, political and Islamic extremism, al-Qaeda, um, nuclear armament possibilities in Iran, um, and of course the, the Israel and Palestine conflicts actually didn't play much of a role in what happened uh, about seven months ago. In fact, what actually drove uh, the, the Arab Spring was an accumulation of frustrations related to economic, social, and political well-being. Um, it started with calls for genuine democratic regime change and a desire for a new order which respected human rights, human political and economic rights. Now, dissidence is not really new in the Middle East and North Africa. I think everybody has seen the clampdowns on um, the media, political um, dissidents, et cetera. We've all been aware of the Green Revolution that happened in 2009. Um, in 2005, the Cedar Revolutions have taken place. But what was actually different about this was that the collective and extremely loud voices of people in the MENA at, we're looking to reaffirm the importance of democracy and universality of human rights um, in a manner that was unprecedented in the region and extremely widespread. It, to, when you try to actually analyze what happened um, in the Arab Spring, it's hard to do that because just as in Europe and Africa, most of the countries don't act in a homogenous bloc. In fact, there are so many differences in cultures, even, the, even in speech, um, political differences in the way people act, 
um, ethnic differences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all these differences have also manifested in themselves in the, way, the various outcomes of the protests. So therefore, it's been hard to categorize or simplify or compare the democratic movements in each country. For example, the way that the military um, went, supported um, the movements in Tunisia and Egypt was very different than what happened with the military in Syria. So um, the Bahrainis acted very differently than all the rest of their Gulf neighbors. Rich countries have acted very differently than poor countries. And, um, and the republics have acted very differently than monarchies. One common factor, though, is that there was a perception of a lack of personal freedoms and the fact that there was a dearth of democratic institutions um, in, with which people could use to express these frustrations. Um, there was also growing economic hardships for the youth who, wanted to, who were looking to create a future for themselves, who were looking to get married and have some degree of financial stability. So as a result, the protests that actually ensued were really highly personal events, um, which people participated in and felt that the outcomes of these re revolutions would have a strong impact on their personal lives. And this is actually what was the tipping point, um, as many people called it, in many of these countries. Now, what are people actually expecting? I should mention here that the notion of democracy, that kind of government in which people actually have a say um, in what the decisions that are made that are going to affect them is not a new notion. It's not an alien notion to the Middle East. And in fact, elections have existed in the Middle East for years and years. Even before the Arab Spring, there were a number of election events that were planned that have happened um, and that are still going to happen, happen that were not a result of the Arab Spring itself. The difference this time, however, is that people actually expect something different to happen as a result of their vote. Um, and this was not the case in the past. In fact, the Middle East is notorious for extremely low voter turnout. Um, but this time, governments need to plan for very high turnout because people actually do think that there's going to be democratic processes that work, their vote is going to count, um, that their voices will be heard, and that as a result, this will positively impact um, them in areas of education, health, employment, um, political freedoms, media freedoms, etc. Um, and if you look at some of the surveys that have actually been done on, in this area and people's expectations, you'll find that people actually expect these things to happen fairly soon after elections take place. Um, some surveys have found that people expect actual changes to take place that will personally affect them within a year. This puts an extreme pressure on governments to deliver solutions addressing the concerns of the people. Now, since the Arab Spring began, there's definitely been degrees of opening of political space, or at least discussions about opening of political space in many of the Arab Spring countries. And this is varied, of course, by degrees. Um, but as we all know, that removing a dictator does not actually mean that democracy um, has happened. It's just the beginning of the process. People want a change in their systems. In Egypt and Tunisia, people have actually succeeded in removing the head of the system, but the challenge still remains about changing the, actual, the system itself. Of the 22 countries, as I mentioned, only two have actually gotten rid of their rulers. Um, general obs observations about what has happened in both are as follows. There has been an increase in media and internet freedom. Political prisoners have been released. New political parties have been allowed to enter the realm. There's been a dismantling of security and former parties. Um, election dates have been set or implied. And in the case of Tunisia, for example, election commission has also been created. The problem with the reforms in both Tunisia and Egypt thus far is that reform priorities have not been clearly defined. There's also been a good degree of um, and difference of opinion about what those priorities should be. The details of implementation are not clear, um, and, reform, and the reform process is murky in general. There's still discussions on the legitimacy of the po political order. Will old regime players have a chance to continue to play a role? Um, the lack of preparedness of the new actors entering the realm. Um, additionally, there's been a great deal of lack of transparency, inclusivity, and comprehensiveness. We can look, take a look at the women's situation, for example. In the previous election law, Egypt did have a quota for women. That is lacking in the new election law, even though one of the new um, uh, the election laws for the, for the chamber does potentially give women a place um, in parliament with some seats reserved. Uh, on the other hand, um, in both of the movements, in both of the protests, you saw lots of women out in the forefront, but you actually don't see them at the table during the reform process. In Tunisia, women 
have achieved parity on the candidates list, but at the same time there's a great fear amongst women's activists that there will be a backward slide uh, in, in their rights as a discussion takes place between um, religious and secular, secular groups about what role women's role is going to be in the community for going forward. Um, there's also been delays in election in Tunisia. And this, um, this ha while these reasons are often legitimate um, for delaying, processes need to be put in place before a legitimate el election can take place, there's also been a great lack of communication by the election authorities, which has led to a lot of fears by people and suspicions that things are going to move backwards or that elections aren't actually going to happen. Um, and in some cases, actually, there has been a backward slide. For example, the election, uh, election law in Tunisia did give powers to an independent election commission to run electoral processes. But in the last couple of weeks, there's been a dismantling of some of the powers that were given to women, uh, given to the, uh, to the election commission. And some of these processes have been passed back to institutions such as the Min Ministry of Interior, which previously inspired uh, fear amongst the folks. Um, I'm not sure how much time I actually have left. I don't know if anybody's keeping yourself a little bit of time. Um, and of course, we've seen in the last couple of weeks as well increasing protests in Egypt for over the purges and the fear that there's been lack of um, lack of actual reform. Um, I'm going to quickly just gloss over what's happened in Jordan, Morocco, which is a different um, scenario as well than what's happened in Egypt and Tunisia. Over there, there were immediately positive overtures made by the monarchy to attempt to preempt any kind of revolution by announcing that commissions and committees would be looking at political reform. In Morocco, the Constitutional Committee did come up in early June with some reform, um, reform recommendations. And little time was actually given to civil society to examine these possible changes. And on July 1st, a referendum was held to which about approximately 72% of Moroccans attended. Morocco is extremely notorious for having very low voter turnout. So this is an example of where people are actually looking to go and, and be a part of the system. Um, of that, 98% are said to have voted yes in the referendum for the changes that would take place. Now it remains to see what actual changes will happen. Um, the constitutional amendments that were recommended were constitutional changes which give the monarchy more of a ceremonial role. Uh, give Parliament more power and protect the judiciary. But the King still is in charge of religion, security, and strategic major po policy choices. Um, so it's anybody's guess about what this will actually result and how much, how much power he'll actually um, lose. Uh, and then again, parliamentary elections are also now scheduled for October 1st, which is one year earlier than they actually were originally uh, scheduled. And this could actually determine the direction that the reform process goes. If more of the parties that get elected are more supportive of, of the uh, king, then it's likely that the reform process could die or slow down. Similarly, in Jordan, there's a national reform dialogue which released recommendations in early June. And excitingly for IFAS, one of the recommendations was the formation of an independent election commission. However, the process towards that is still not quite clear. Um, I will gloss over what's going on in Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, and Libya because, of course, in all of those places, there have been protests, there, have been, uh, there has been a call by uh, the citizens for change, but the process and where it's going is still very, very murky, and we just have no idea at this point whether any changes will actually take place. Um, so i finally just like to conclude that there are many factors that will continue to shape the reform movement. There is the continuing struggle between reformists and the entrenched forces. Um, there will be the shape of the new political order. There's still a question about what the role of Islamists will be, what the role of security forces will be. Uh, there needs to be more of a discussion about the open and transparent dialogue with stakeholders, which hasn't actually resulted at this point. Uh, there needs to be encouraging of democratic openness while not un undermining other fo foreign policy in interests. But also vital to demonstra demonstrable progress to continue towards competitive and open political processes is the fact that it must be a participatory process where the electorate actually feels that it's informed and engaged about what's happening. There needs to be increased oversight of political processes, especially the electoral processes, by authorities who are professional, independent, transparent, and accountable. And all of this needs to run side by side with economic, thoughtful economic reforms that are taking place at the same time. And all of this actually needs to take place over a long term. Um, 
for a credible transfer to happen, people actually have to believe that these changes are taking place for them and that they are a part of these. And so this is the only way that citizens are going to feel confident in the changes that take place and that countries will have meaningful and political reform. For a setting the stage, thank you very much. That uh, required a, a great deal of analysis of a, a great number of complicated simultaneous movements. And now to set the stage from the perspective of the European Parliament, one of the great thought leaders and policy makers who will probably be on the ground watching many of these elections and changes. Mr. Brock, would you take the stage? Yes. Uh